For the curators, archivists, and librarians working in special collections divisions across the state and the country, maintaining a historical record through the collection of manuscripts, multimedia, and printed forms is not only important to their work, but also necessary to their institutions. Despite all this, we are often unaware of the need to maintain our own records for future use. A History of Special Collections considers the archival history of the archives themselves and demonstrates the importance of developing and maintaining institutional knowledge. Join us as we trace the trajectory and evolution of the division over the last seven decades, with unique holdings from each department that tell a story of dedication, scholarship, and commitment to research and access, from the early antecedents in the Utah Room to the most contemporary iteration. The origins of the Special Collections Division at the J. Willard Marriott Library can be traced back to the mid-19th century with the founding of both the University of Deseret and the Utah Territorial Library. The University of Deseret was established on February 28, 1850, with Orson Spencer appointed as Chancellor. Due to economic hardships, however, suitable space, educated instructors, and books were in short supply. After three very difficult years, the budding university was forced to temporarily suspend operations. Although the need for higher learning was strong, the financial foundation was simply not strong enough. By 1869, conditions in the Utah Territory gradually began to change. Relations with the federal government had improved and the Transcontinental Railroad was recently completed. Territorial leaders began to prioritize the university once more. And in 1869, John R. Park was hired to be the university's first president. Within the first few years of his tenure, Park determined that the need for a university library was both immediate and great. In order to fill the shelves, he decided to loan his personal collection of books, more than 2,000 volumes, to the institution. Park held the position of university president until 1892. And two years later, on June 9, 1894, his entire private library was formally given to the university. These volumes can now be found within special collections identified by Park's signature. The Utah Territorial Library was established the same year as the University of Deseret and within the first two years included some 3,000 volumes in its holdings. In 1891, however, a majority of those titles were transferred to the University of Deseret. When Utah finally became a state in 1896, the remaining books from the Territorial Library became part of the State Library's collection, now called the Utah State Law Library. Today, the holdings transferred from the Utah Territorial Library have been dispersed throughout special collections and can be identified by a red oval stamp. In 1941, Leonard H. Kirkpatrick became the head librarian of the University Library, and for the next two decades, he dealt with the tumultuous changes brought on by both the Great Depression and World War II. Fortunately for Kirkpatrick, A. Ray Olpin became the university president at just the right time, bringing with him a new vision which saw the library as the center of both research and educational programs, asserting that a great school without a great library is an impossibility. Kirkpatrick and his assistant, Ralph D. Thompson, translated President Olpin's vision for the university into action with the official beginning of the Utah Room in 1946. Through the development of special grants, L.H. Kirkpatrick was able to seek out and purchase notable collections related to Utah history. The first of its kind was purchased in 1946, when a fund of $5,000 was allotted to the library for the acquisition of the John A. Widstow Collection of Mormon Americana. Widstow was the University of Utah president from 1916 through 1921, and had also served in various capacities in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His personal library consisted of approximately 3,000 items and included early Mormon periodicals such as the Elder's Journal and the Evening and Morning Star. A separate room with its own catalog formally opened in room 101 of the Thomas Building. Whitstow's daughter, Anna Whitstow Wallace, was perhaps the only other person truly familiar with the Whitstow collection and was selected to supervise the newly opened Utah room. The Utah Room held a special place in Kirkpatrick's favor. He saw the collection of Mormon Americana, Utah history, and University of Utah materials as an important area for research possibilities. Unsatisfied with the acquisition of the Witso collection, Kirkpatrick and Thompson embarked on an extensive campaign to garner new personal libraries. 
The second notable collection for the Utah Room was the acquisition of the John Mills Whitaker Collection. Whitaker was not only the secretary to church president John Taylor, but he was Taylor's son-in-law as well. Among the items received from the Whitaker were the juvenile instructor, the contributor, and the improvement era. The library also received permission to photocopy Whitaker's journal in which he had recorded events without missing a day. During the same period, Kirkpatrick had negotiated the acquisition of Judge Tillman D. Johnson's personal library. Judge Johnson had served as Utah's second district court judge from 1915 to 1949 and had collected a personal library of a wide range of materials on subjects related to the West. Kirkpatrick would describe the collection as excellent Western Americana with particular strength for such states as Wyoming, Colorado, and Nevada, along with a fine collection of Indian material and a good set of first editions of Mark Twain. A special book plate was designed for the collection by Carol Selby. By the end of the 1950s, the library also received the first set of congressional papers from William A. Dawson. With the acquisition of the John Whitaker Collection, Tillman Johnson's personal library, and the congressional papers of William Dawson, the holdings of the Utah Room began to broaden into the genre of Western Americana. In anticipation of the move to the new library building in 1968, the Utah Room officially changed its name in 1967 to Western Americana Rare Books and University Archives in order to better reflect its holdings. At the time, the growing collection included approximately 33,000 bound volumes and 61,000 unbound volumes. It was clear that there was a great need for a director to oversee the operations, advocate for increased staffing and budget, and build the collection into one that would soon see international acclaim. For this role, Ralph Thompson approached the director of the Utah State Historical Society, Everett Cooley, promising him creative freedom and a substantial budget. He accepted the position and began work on January 1, 1969. Almost immediately after Cooley's arrival, things began to change. That previous year, John Willard Marriott Sr. had donated $1 million for library acquisitions, the largest single contribution ever received by the university at that time. For his gift, the current five-story building was named in his honor. Fortunately for Cooley, the acquisitions librarian David Laird was a close friend and shared similar interests in the collection of Western Americana materials and other items related to Native American histories. Laird would end up playing a major role in locating and recommending purchases for the collection. Using the Marriott funds, Cooley was able to purchase over 50% of the titles listed in the Plains and the Rockies. This Wagner Camp bibliography, as it is often called, contains books published about the West during the years between 1805 to 1860. Combined with the library of Judge Tillman D. Johnson, these acquisitions placed the Marriott Library among the top dozen university libraries with significant Wagner Camp holdings. A second major collection that was acquired as a result of the Marriott gift was approximately 1,000 titles related to the history of science a collection that had been assembled by anatomist Herbert McLean Evans. Of these titles, some 350 could be considered classics in the field. The History of Science collection included first and early editions from the likes of Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Andreas Vesalius, and Andreas Solarius, to name but a few. In 1971, the department changed its name once again, this time to Special Collections. The Marriott gift was not the only financial benefit received by special collections during the early 70s. Entrepreneur and philanthropist Obert C. Tanner also contributed greatly to the growth of the development during that time. Throughout his life, Tanner and his wife, Grace, generously donated to communities, universities, parks, the arts, and the people of the state of Utah. They were patrons of the Utah Symphony, Ballet West, and the Utah Opera Company. They endowed the biennial Gift of Music Concerts of the Utah Symphony and Mormon Tabernacle Choir and established the Tanner Lectures on Human Values, providing annual ethics lectures at nine prestigious universities in the United States and in England. Throughout the valley, the family name can be found on buildings, fountains, and even parks. In 1971, O.C. Tanner established the Annie Clark Tanner Room at the Marriott Library in memory of his mother. 
The room was thereby converted into a special reading room for patrons of special collections. The following year, Tanner developed the Annie Clark Tanner Memorial Trust in order to publish limited editions of books on Utah, the Mormons, and the West. The first volume, A Mormon Mother, an autobiography of Annie Clark Tanner, was published in 1973. The most popular title of the series, selling more than 10,000 copies in the first decade, A Mormon Mother has since gone through various reprints, which continue to sell out. During his tenure as head of special collections, Ebert Cooley oversaw the publication of 11 books in the Tanner Trust series, acting as general editor, while Marjorie Ward held the responsibility of the press editor. Certainly, the University Library had many generous friends along the way. However, it was not until 1972 that an official Friends of the Library organization was established. Responsible for developing the Friends group were Brigham Madsen, Director of Libraries, August Gus Hannibal, Extension Librarian, and Everett Cooley, Director of Special Collections. The mission of the Friends of the Marriott Library is simple, to provide for enrichment of learning and promote the public welfare and cultural opportunities through library programs. To sponsor lectures, informal discussion groups, exhibits, and other means for people to become acquainted and share their enthusiasm for learning, books, and other library media to organize alumni and other friends of the University of Utah to participate in efforts to broaden public understanding and appreciation of the facilities, collections, works, and activities of the Marriott Library, to assist in, in expanding the resources of the library by encouraging monetary gifts, bequests, and memorials, and the donation of collections and other library materials. Lastly, to acquire unique publications and to publish significant works based on unusual holdings in possession of the Marriott Library. Everett Cooley became very involved in organizing the programs, fundraisers, and events for the Friends of the Marriott Library. And with help from the Friends, the library was able to purchase for special collections its two millionth volume, the 16th century herbal Historia Sterpium by Leonard Fuchs. One need only look through the Friends scrapbook and read the annual reports to see all the positive contributions the Friends made to the library. Among these are the acquisitions of the Columbian Press, the Catlin Portfolio, Hastings Emigrant's Guide to California, and plates from John James Audubon. There may be no way of determine, determining how many other special items have come to the library as a result of the positive public relations that the Friends have provided through their programs and activities. There is also no way to measure how effectively they may have addressed the process of learning and understanding not only about the library, but also about other subjects that have been offered through lectures, tours, exhibitions, and dinner meetings. For more than 50 years, the Friends of the Marriott Library have served both the University of Utah and the Intermountain community, while maintaining wholeheartedly committed to the use of the special resources of the Marriott Library's special collections holdings. In 1977, University of Utah alumni Dr. Claudius Y. Gates and his wife, Catherine Budge Gates, donated their library of rare books, which included a complete collection of Allen Press books and ephemera, to special collections. The Allen Press was one of the most famous of all 20th century fine presses. The donation of the Allen Press books was celebrated at a public event and exhibition the following year. Attending as honored guests, both the Gates and Allen families were taken with the appreciation of the University of Utah community and especially the staff at the Marriott Library. In 1981, the Allens decided to donate their 1846 Columbian hand press with the understanding that the library would establish their own working press and also use it for instruction. The Allens donated one half the monetary value of the Columbian press, while the Gates family and the friends of the library provided the other half of the cost, along with sufficient funds to undertake the publication of some ephemera and the first book printed under the imprint of the Red Butte Press. Printing began under the supervision of Everett Cooley. However, the printing itself was done by Jean Terricio, a staff member of the Library Preservation and Conservation Department. Although Ms. Terricio had her own rotary proof press and had done some small projects, she was not familiar with the larger Columbian Press. So she was sent by the library to the University of Nevada, Reno, to obtain training under Kenneth Carpenter, who offered hand press classes. Upon Ms. Terricio's return from Reno, she began printing small items from the library. 
She also began teaching classes in hand press printing through the Division of Continuing Education. Gaining confidence and sufficient funds, Ms. Terricio in 1984 completed the first book of Red Butte Press called A Journey to Great Salt Lake City. An edition of 50 copies was printed and immediately sold out. Since 1984, the Red Butte Press now touts a total of 18 titles, with its latest, Oracle Bones, published in 2024. The press commissions original artwork, uses quality paper and binding materials, and prints letterpress to make each book a reflection of its contents. The Red Butte Press prioritizes in-house production, opportunities for student participation, innovative graphic and structural design, and meaningful collaborations with local and regional artists, authors, and academics. An extension of the Red Butte Press is the Marriott Library's Book Arts Program. Since 1995, the Book Arts Program has encouraged appreciation for the art and history of the book, not only on campus, but among the wider Intermountain West communities. The Book Arts Program was established by Rare Books curator Madeline Garrett, the same year that the Rocky Mountain Guild of Book Workers was created. Both were in response to a growing need for bookmaking opportunities in the Intermountain West. The program was launched with an inaugural lecture by British design binder Philip Smith in the autumn of 1995. Soon there were workshops, lectures, summer intensives, semester-long classes in bookmaking, and incredible guests from around the world including Tim Eli, Daniel Kelm, Ken Campbell, Jean Ballantyne, Laura Waite, Dominic Riley, Carol Paulson, Jean Formo, Sheila Waters, and many more. Today, the fully equipped studio allows students to learn skills such as papermaking, bookbinding, letterpress, typography, and book design. The program also offers a minor and certificate in book arts, as well as a BA and MFA in book arts, supported by both the art and English departments. Student work from each of the classes is displayed in our annual Booking a Brouhaha exhibition, featured in the Special Collections Exhibition Gallery outside the Book Arts Studio. Additionally, the Book Arts Studio provides community programming for adults and has ongoing K-12 outreach initiatives. Beginning in 2004, the Book Arts Treasure Chest has been taking book arts directly into Utah classrooms. Treasure Chest teachers present a history of the book lesson using rare books and facsimiles as examples that students view and handle, then guide them in making a book that relates to their current curriculum. The program makes classroom visits and hosts workshops celebrating the innovation, collaboration, and excitement for learning that come from expressing ideas through creative hands-on experience. The program also provides educators workshops with ideas for cross-disciplinary lessons and bookmaking techniques to integrate into K-12 curricula. Through these free grant-supported workshops, the program strives to deliver a variety of bookmaking instruction suitable for teachers and students of all grade levels and abilities. Educators intensives are offered every summer, as well as half-day workshops for teachers throughout the year. The Rare Books Collections Corps was initially made up of books from the Utah Territorial Library, the University of Deseret Library, and the John R. Park Private Book Collection. Over the years, other individual library collections were acquired by our library. As the collection consisted mainly of books on Utah and the Mormons, these collections were put together and set aside in a special room called the Utah Room. Other gifts and donations came in gradually, and by 1965, the rare collection numbered almost 30 bound volumes. Thanks to university funding and generous gifts, the rare books collection has continued to grow over the last five decades. While the criteria which determine what makes a book rare can vary, some of the most important qualities include age, scarcity, print history, and provenance, in addition to historic, cultural, and aesthetic value. Today, the collection has a holding of more than 80,000 items, comprised of books, maps, ephemera, and realia, documenting the record of human communication, from 4,000-year-old Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books. The strengths of the Rare Books collection include the history of science, religion, and printing, materials that highlight overland exploration and the American West, limited editions of fine press and artist books, manuscript facsimiles from medieval Europe and Mesoamerica, 
as well as one of the nation's largest Middle East collections. Without a doubt, the rare books at the J. Willard Marriott Library are special. And while a certain set of criteria might make a book rare, the true value of a book should not be determined by a price tag. Books are important to our understanding of history and to ensure that our history reflects all kinds of voices, the Rare Books Department continues to collect books and continues to tell their stories. Most importantly, we will continue to argue that there is nothing like holding the real thing in your hands. When the name of Western Americana Rare Books and University Archives was changed to Special Collections in 1971, it reflected a shift in the holding. In addition to the growing emphasis of rare books, Everett Cooley was also made responsible for the impressive Middle East Library, under the premise that it was a specialized collection. The Middle East Library had been established alongside the Middle East Studies Program in 1959 with the arrival of Aziz Atiyah. Atiyah was a prominent scholar, writer, historian, and librarian whose expertise spanned the fields of the Crusades and Islamic and Coptic studies. In addition to his role as professor of languages and history, Atiyah was tasked with building a center for the study of Arabic and Middle East cultures. Fortunately, Atiyah had brought his already sizable library collection to the university. He was also provided funds to purchase additional books and manuscripts. While making numerous visits to his homeland of Egypt, Atiyah was extremely successful in acquiring large quantities of books at very low prices. These books were initially presided over by Marion Sheep. Following the construction and move to the new Marriott Library in 1968, Atiyah was provided offices, space for books, and a vault for the valuable rarities he had collected, including several unique Qurans and fragments. The fragments now form part of the Arabic papyrus parchment and paper collection, which is the largest of its kind in the United States, containing 770 Arabic papyrus documents, 1,300 Arabic paper documents, and several pieces on parchment. To make them usable to scholars, Mrs. Atiyah spent untold hours carefully unfolding, flattening, and encasing the papyri in glass for protection. Today, they are digitized and available to researchers all over the world. Since the Middle East collection was strong on Arabic materials, the local Jewish community established a fundraiser to garner $100,000 for the purchase of Hebraica Judaica materials. This effort was spearheaded by Benjamin Rowe, a local philanthropist merchant and University of Utah scholar and instructor, Louis Sucker. Although they were only able to raise $64,000, this money was turned over to the library for the acquisition of books on Jewish history, culture, and traditions. The local Jewish community also donated personal books, manuscripts, scrolls, and photographs documenting local activities. Among the many volunteers that offered their time and expertise to special collections, one of the most notable was Emeritus Professor William Kim Newby. Formerly a professor of biology at the University of Utah, Newby was recruited by Everett Cooley to practice some of his woodworking skills with special collections. Newby became interested in a wooden chest that was handmade by Frederick Kessler, a millwright and bishop of the LDS Church. Inside the chest were diaries, an autobiography, and other various memorabilia. But unfortunately, the chest was in dire need of repair. Newby used his woodworking skills to complete a masterful job of restoration. From that, he turned to some of the documents found in the chest, including a manuscript half page from the 14th chapter of the first book of Nephi in the Book of Mormon. For several years, Cooley struggled to develop a conservation program at the University of Utah. During this time, several serious repairs and treatments were sent out of state to places like W.J. Barrow Restoration Shop in Virginia, and Storm Bindery in Arizona. In 1977, the library persuaded Paul Folger from the LDS Church Historical Library to head the preservation program following William Newby. Folger received a laboratory with special facilities for deacidification, encapsulation, and careful handling. The Preservation and Restoration Department began serious work on preserving not just rare books and manuscripts, but also books and serials throughout the whole library. Folger set up procedures and developed a staff that could accomplish large-scale preservation. 
and while not administratively connected to Special Collections at the time, preservation was physically located in the Special Collections Department, and practically all of the early treatments were done on the rare books, manuscripts, and maps in those holdings. Bulger and his staff were also incredibly involved in the exhibition displays, the teaching program on archives and manuscripts, and the publications of the Red Butte Press. Preservation includes a range of preventative conservation measures used to safeguard historically, artistically, and culturally significant collections. Preventative conservation includes setting priorities, allocating resources, and training staff to prevent damage and ensure optimal long-term care of the library's heritage collections. Conservation, which is remedial, is carried out by the conservators and technicians and involves expert, hands-on physical treatment and technical decision-making required to competently care for unique, tangible artifacts. Today, the Marriott Library's Preservation Department occupies a bespoke conservation lab located on the library's fifth floor. This purpose-built lab supports the hands-on treatment and technical decision-making associated with the conservation of rare and valuable objects housed in the library's general and special collections. Found among the earliest collections donated to the university library were handwritten documents or manuscripts, diaries, journals, correspondence, as well as business and organizational records, photographs, films, and other recordings. As more collections were acquired, the need for space and staff to oversee the materials became ever more apparent. The very nature of such items places them in a category different from other research materials. The most distinctive characteristic of a manuscript collection is that, in most instances, it is unique. Its loss or mutilation cannot be corrected by the purchase of another one. Once gone, it is lost to all prospective users. By 1970, the library had more than 150 separate manuscript collections that needed to be processed. Unfortunately, neither staff nor finances were readily available to take on the work. While manuscript collections continued to accumulate, Everett Cooley was forced to reevaluate the collecting policies. Cooley decided to concentrate on manuscripts from Utahns, about Utahns, or by Utahns who had made their mark those living outside of Utah, but who still identified with the region or university. Examples of such papers collected are those of Fawn Brody, Wallace Stegner, Sonia Johnson, and J. Willard Marriott. The following year, the Manuscripts Department of Special Collections was officially established with the purpose of housing, processing, and making accessible all those unpublished historical resources that are classified as manuscripts. Although the department was finally funded and staffed, the backlog of unprocessed materials kept growing. In a letter to the Director of Libraries, Roger Hansen, dated November 1976, Cooley wrote, Record collecting is something like a snowball rolling downhill. It grows as it accelerates. The word seems to spread that the place to deposit one's records is at an institution or repository that has a good collection and draws users. This trend continued for more than a decade, reaching a critical juncture by the late 1980s, when newly accessioned collections skyrocketed. The holdings had doubled to over 7,000 linear feet from 1985 to 1990, and were on track to double again within the next decade. Today, the Manuscripts Department houses more than 1,600 unpublished historical collections, each accompanied by detailed finding aids. While political papers form the largest single group of collections within the holdings of the Manuscripts Department, other collecting strengths include LDS church history, outdoor recreation, mining records, architectural designs, ethnic collections, and the arts. Collection highlights include the Utah Pride Center, Downwinders of Utah, the papers of civil rights activist Alberta Henry, as well as the archives of former NASA administrator and university president Jane C. Fletcher. Donations of manuscript materials to the Library Special Collections Division would often consist of other personal memorabilia, such as photographs, moving images, audio recordings, and other forms of multimedia. As with manuscripts, these original, unique, and unpublished collections offer the opportunity to hear the voices of the past and see historic scenes and artistic visions brought to life. Processing the diverse collection, however, proved to have its own challenges. The archives needed additional equipment and technology, as well as an appropriately trained staff. 
By the end of the 20th century, the rapid growth of technology could be seen throughout the entire library, and Special Collections was no different. It became evident that the multimedia collections held in manuscripts required extra attention and expertise. Nancy Young, the manuscripts librarian, advocated the separation of the two areas, suggesting that each be managed by its own archivist. In January 1994, the oral and graphic department was finally established as a subsection supervised by Roy Webb, who tirelessly fought for the needs of the materials and the patrons who would use them. Further restructuring of the collections took place upon Mrs. Young's retirement in 1997. A survey was sent out to employees to understand how they envisioned special collections growing and evolving in the coming century. The staff responded with recommendations for Greg Thompson, who had replaced Everett Cooley as Director of Special Collections in 1983. Almost unanimously, the archivists and curators expressed their approval of creating a new multimedia department. Other comments saw strengthening in the areas of donor relations, collection development, and financial development, making collection materials the responsibility of area curators, and centralizing the overall patron and reference experience. Today, the multimedia department consists of over 600,000 images of all types, more than 500 films on all formats and size, and thousands of audio and videotapes across some 800 separate collections. In addition to the numbered collections, the holdings also contain the photographs and audiovisual archives of the university. But some of the most notable collections include materials related to outdoor recreation, such as the Wasatch Mountain Club, Women's History and Equal Rights Amendment, such as the Sonia Johnson Collection, ethnic communities like the Japanese American Citizens League, as well as local and regional interviews, such as the Doris Duke American Indian Oral Histories. In 1967, the Utah Room was renamed Western Americana Rare Books and University Archives. This name change reflected the broadening scope of the collection that had begun with the support of L.H. Kirkpatrick and the acquisition of collections such as Judge Tillman D. Johnson's personal library and William A. Dawson's congressional papers. Western Americana contained sources on the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the state of Utah, and the Intermountain West. While the collection initially started with books, it expanded to include a range of secondary sources, including maps, newspapers, serials, and clipping files. Given the ever-expanding type of material and the depth of the subject matter, the department was renamed Print and Journal in 2016 to reflect its contents more accurately. The Print and Journal department provides access to sources on the history of the West, ranging from books to news clippings. University history is represented in holdings, such as a complete run of the Utonian and course catalogs through the decades. The department also provides Utah reference sources, such as city directories and access to serials. Print and journals varied materials complement the overall holdings of special collections. They provide essential secondary sources in support of archival and manuscript material and represent a significant collection of sources on Western history across the Intermountain West. The first attempt to write the history of an institution of higher education began in the mid-19th century and prompted administrations across the country to establish university archives to better preserve such records. An official policy for collecting records at the University of Utah was not established until 1967 when the Utah Room formally changed its name to Western Americana, Rare Books, and University Archives under the leadership of librarian Ruth Yeaman. Gaiman supervised the functions of the Utah Room from 1961 until 1968 and oversaw the move into the new Marriott Library. She continued to oversee Western Americana into the 1980s and rare books until 1993. Upon Cooley's arrival, he hired Ferd T. Johnson, a former staff member at the Utah State Historical Society, to head the records management program of the university archives. In an effort to convince the administration of needed upgrades, Cooley brought out boxes of university records, which were found in the attic of the Cowles building where the windows had been broken out and pigeons had been roosting. He also presented the minute books of the Board of Regents, which he located in the vault of the park building. On closer inspection, Cooley found that the termites had riddled the papers of former President John A. Witso. 
Covered with bugs, manure, and all kinds of other dirt and debris, Cooley was able to show what neglect does to these kinds of records. And for that, he received unanimous support. Cooley and Johnson were able to acquire space in the pharmacy building and add part-time help. When the plans for the establishment of a records management program were being formulated in 1969, Cooley had the following steps in mind. First, he wanted to produce a new records and archives policy statement for the University Policy and Procedures Manual. Next, he wanted to make a survey of all the records stored in temporary buildings, attics, basements, and department offices, arranging for their destruction or for the transfer to the new center. By the end of 1970, 3,884 cubic feet of records had been accessioned. A separate university archives location housed all the university's textual documents deemed to have a permanent historic value. When Johnson retired in the early 1980s, Clint Bailey became the division head. Today, there are more than 500 fully processed archival collections preserving the history of the University of Utah, available for both institutional and public patron use. Some of these materials include historical records of administrative and academic units, presidential papers, and minutes of the Board of Trustees and Academic Senate. University Archives holds more than 30,000 cubic feet of records and over 17,000 campus architectural drawings. Reference services and libraries allow researchers to access and evaluate sources, ask questions, and engage with library materials. From the earliest days of the division to its current iteration, Special Collections has always remained committed to providing access to its materials for researchers. In 1971, the Annie Clark Tanner Room, furnished by O.C. Tanner in memory of his mother, was converted to a special reading room for patrons. The books in Western Americana were designated as non-circulating and the stacks were closed to browsers. A similar model is followed today. Researchers access special collections materials in the George S. Eccles Reading Room, a dedicated quiet study space on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library. With a beautiful view of the Ochre Mountains, the reading room is comprised of study tables, two multimedia computer terminals, and an exhibition space. The reading room is currently open Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Researchers make appointments through the library website and have access to a faculty or staff member during their visit to ask questions and request more materials. Due to the rare and unique nature of special collections materials, researchers observe certain care and handling procedures while working with the collection. Personal items are left in lockers in the reading room lobby, bound materials are placed in foam cradles, Archival materials are looked at one folder at a time to keep contents in order, and photographs are handled with nitrile gloves. These procedures help preserve special collections materials, guaranteeing that they will be available for generations to come. For researchers who are not able to visit the reading room, curators, archivists, and the reference librarian for special collections work together to answer reference questions, provide reproductions for a fee, and add material to the digital library as appropriate. Researchers may also schedule virtual or in-person meetings with Special Collections faculty and staff to discuss their research and how Special Collections materials might support their work. Research and access are at the heart of Special Collections' mission. Reference services allow researchers to not only work with materials, but to have their research questions and needs met with focused particularity. Whether it is in person, in the reading room, over email, or on the phone, researchers can find support for their projects in a multitude of ways in special collections. Instruction in special collections has become a hallmark of the department, starting in the 1990s. From book arts programming to individualized class sessions for University of Utah courses, the department's faculty and staff introduces diverse audiences to special collections materials through engaging, hands-on experiences. Special Collections instruction opportunities began formally in 1995 when the Book Arts program was established by Rare Books curator Madeline Garrett. The Book Arts program has encouraged appreciation for the art and history of the book, not only on campus, but among the wider Intermountain West community. For the campus community, Special Collections pairs with faculty across the campus to offer individualized class sessions tailored to their course topics and learning objectives. 
Students learn skills such as archival research methods and care and handling procedures for rare and unique material before working with collections chosen specifically for their class. Special Collections classes provide a hands-on experience of working with rare materials from manuscripts and rare books to maps, artist books, and realia. Class sessions are accompanied by collaborative exercises and guided discussions to allow students to process the content they have viewed and begin applying their research to the larger conversations and projects of the course. Special Collections also partners with area schools to offer class sessions on materials that support the K-12 curriculum. During the academic year of 2022 to 2023, classes of 6th graders, 8th graders, and high school students visited Special Collections to view and learn more from the department's History of Science collection, Japanese American archive, and rare books. The students learned strategies for visual analysis, the role of digital research, and the importance of primary sources when studying history. Collaborating with faculty and students across disciplines and institutions is an essential part of Special Collections. The opportunity to introduce students to archival research and provide access to unique materials forms a significant part of the department's function within the library. Special Collections at the Marriott Library has a rich history, an access-focused present, and a community-driven future. The division works to support not only research and teaching on its academic campus, but the research and access needs of state, national, and international researchers. Special Collections is also dedicated to preserving the stories and experiences of the communities that make up its diverse audiences. To achieve these goals, the division is committed to actively growing its collections, particularly with contemporary materials. Special Collections is not a stagnant collection of materials, but an ever-expanding repository of multiple mediums. The Reverend France A. Davis Papers is a recent donation and the inaugural collection of the France Davis Utah Black Archive. Reverend Davis, a retired pastor, father, husband, community leader, civil rights leader, and educator, donated his physical papers to the Marriott Library, where they are available to researchers in the reading room and in the digital library. The France Davis Utah Black Archive is designed to house digital oral histories, photographs, community records, and personal documents from Utah's black community. These vital collections represent the importance of preserving and making accessible community voices and experiences. The final essential piece of Special Collections is the faculty, staff, and part-time employees who process and maintain the collections, facilitate research, and provide instruction. Under the leadership of Associate Dean for Special Collections Todd Samuelson and Sarah Shreves, the Alice Sheets Marriott Dean of Libraries, Special Collections faculty, staff, and part-time employees look forward to the future of the division and the ways in which they can continue to serve multiple audiences. This exhibition explores unique holdings from each of the departments within the Special Collections Division and reveals a story of dedication, scholarship, and commitment to research and access, both in the past and as the division moves into the future.